Yeah, as far as I'm concerned, uh, digital prediction and, uh, and uh, DCPs is the death of cinema as I know it. Uh, it's not even about shooting your film on film or shooting your film on digital. Uh, the fact that most films now are not presented in 35 millimeter means that the war is lost. And uh, digital projections, that's just television in public. And apparently the whole world is okay with television in public, but what I knew as cinema is dead. So last night, as I'm prone to do, I was on some tirade about filmmaking, and I got to the film versus digital thing. As you can probably tell by my subscriber count, I don't know what I'm talking about. I'm not a filmmaker in the, not even the ballpark, I'm not even the same state or zip code or country as Tarantino or Nolan or anybody who knows what they're talking about with that sort of thing. However, I do have an opinion, <laughs> and I'm gonna do my best not to be a dick about it because I try not to be a dick in my normal life. That clip that I just played is from a longer video um, that is about, it's comparing and contrasting Quentin Tarantino talking about film and Roger Deakins talking about film and digital and in his way. And what stuck out to me was I got mad <laughs> at Quentin Tarantino, who doesn't know I exist, because he grew up in a different time period than I did. And let me explain what that means. For someone like me, for someone at my level, film isn't an option. Um, realistically, I mean, Aiden Robbins just did a video where he revealed, uh, that he, not revealed, he had shot something on 16 millimeter and he broke down the price and I think it was like something like 600 or $700 for what equated to, I think, 40 minutes, if that. I don't actually know if I'm, I'm I might be lying, it might be way less than that. I'm making a two hour movie this summer. Th that isn't happening. Also, Super 16 looks like shit compared to what I want my film to look like. Super, no, quick. Super 16 is appropriate for certain stories, not for this one. So for my purposes, it would stick out. It would look like shit. It's not light sensitive enough, which is why I'm shooting on the A7S. It's, it's not enough for me. It's not what I need. It's different, I need a different format. 35 millimeter also comes with the assumption of a larger budget. Tenet, Inception, The Hateful Eight, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, um, Hail Caesar, Fucking any movie basically that was shot in the past hundred years, because a vast majority of them were shot on film, you have to assume a certain level of budget in order to shoot things at night, in order to shoot things in certain lighting scenarios, because at that point you can afford to light them. Um, personally, I own one tiny $60 uh, newer light, which is over there. That blooms really nicely. This is the only light I own, okay? It was 60 bucks, I got it three years ago as a birthday gift. And while I love it, this won't light a film. This will bounce off the ceiling if you have an A7S and you can see. But 35 millimeter, I mean, you'd have to point it directly at your face and hope that it works out. Turn that off. Basically, 35 millimeter isn't feasible for me and when I went on to watch some of these videos and see that, uh, I forgot if it was Quentin Tarantino or Chris Nolan who said this, but uh, they were very upset at the idea of uh, someone watching a film on an iPad. And that also got me upset <laughs> for different reasons. Um, my, the first film I ever watched that made me go, I want to be a filmmaker was King Kong from 1933. King Kong looks like shit. It is a grainy, degraded negative from, at the time, 60 or 70 years earlier. Now it's been nearly 100 years because I'm old now. And it, it doesn't look great. Um, it's in black and white, which is another barrier of separation because by the time I was a kid, everything was in color. If it wasn't, it was because it was on TV land or something. And yet, I fell in love with it, watching it on a little 13-inch box that was a four by three aspect ratio that, you know, was smaller than an iPad. Meanwhile, hold on, I have one over here. This is my wife's iPad. It is, I think, 10 inches across, or something like that, I don't fucking know, it's an iPad. It's huge, it's got a beautiful retina display, and it has speakers that don't suck. I had none of those things when I fell in love with cinema, so the idea of, you know, a kid watching Frozen, or watching, I can't think of any other movies right now, King Kong, let's say another kid watches King Kong on an iPad, they're watching it with better quality and better sound and better everything, especially if they have headphones, better anything than I ever had as a kid. Filmmaking is meant to be consumed, it's entertainment, and the idea of like film only exists if it's projected in a theater is 
not just pretentious, but kind of upsetting because it, it really makes you feel less than. Now, real quick, Tarantino actually said this at the end of that same video. He talked about how uh, digital is awesome for people like me who are uh, low budget, no budget kids who uh, are just starting out, don't really have the resources yet. They can pick up a phone, they can pick up an iPad, they can pick up whatever and really get to work and show their film. And this, these are people who I guess I would define myself as middle class. Um, but when I was a kid, I, I was homeless. I didn't have any money for an iPad, let alone a fucking film camera. My dad never had a, you know, we had maybe a VHS camera somewhere, um, but never any VHS tape to shoot on because it was a commodity. It cost money and it wasn't something that you could just delete and try again. It was something that you needed equipment in order to ingest the footage and see it. With an iPad, this iPad is an entire filmmaking suite. It may not be the best suite on the planet, but I can write, shoot, edit, and post a video, a film, from this fucking thing. That is insane. It's hot pink, for God's sake. Anyway, the sort of attitude with the film versus digital debate is frustrating. Um, you're putting a lot of credence into something that is really not that important. The the file format that you capture in the file format or the uh, film format or whatever it is you, t you capture on is at this point nearly irrelevant. I say nearly. In terms of film, 8mm, high grain, 16mm, grainy, old Super 35 versus new, clean Super 35, those will have aesthetic differences just in terms of like Literally, the grain is gonna be bigger. Literally, the image is gonna be smaller. When you blow it up, it's gonna be softer. That's just math. The A7S II is gonna look different than the A7S I, only in the sense that the A7S II shoots 4K. The A7S III shoots 6K, down samples to 4K. That 4K is probably gonna look cleaner. There's four million videos about it. I've watched all of them, I, and I know that. However, my wife, my mom, my sisters, my brother, they don't know any of this shit, and quite frankly, they could not give a fuck less. None of them care about what something was captured on. I'm, I'm looking at a movie now, Super 8, shot on 35 millimeter film. Also has an ass load of visual effects in it. Each one of those sequences of film were scanned into a computer to do the visual effects. I'm also at least 86% certain that they did a digital color grade with Super 8, so they probably scanned the entire film and did it in DaVinci or some semblance of that and re-exported it in Cinema DNG and re-scanned it to film for the film prints and then re-scanned -re, uh, it to Blu-ray or whatever. At what point is the, you know, film acquisition no longer that important? Because also in Knives Out, Knives Out is one of my favorite looking films I've ever seen in my life. I, I don't know how to describe it. It's, it's gorgeous and I love looking at it and all of it was captured on Alexa Mini, and it doesn't look like anything else I've ever seen on an Alexa Mini. The reason being that Steve Yedlin is a psychopath, and I love him, because he has studied the fuck out of every film format available, some not available, he shot at 11K IMAX for one, and has broken it down to its base components and is able to manufacture a look that looks like anything you want it to, but more importantly, he can make his own look. He puts his own stamp on it. He's able to use whatever file acquisition format he uses, or, or I, I shouldn't say file, any acquisition format, and turn it into the end product. Because any, I'm paraphrasing here, but any sufficiently high quality digital codec is indistinguishable once processed from any significant, significant uh, sufficiently sophisticated film format. And when I first watched these tests a few years ago, I didn't know what he was talking about. I was an idiot. I, I didn't know anything. Now I'm slightly less of an idiot and I get it. It's true. The A7S doesn't fall into that bracket of, of uh, sufficiently evolved sort of digital acquisition. But in terms of my world where I live, where, you know, I don't know people who have directed and starred in and, and DP'd for Knives Out or a James Bond movie or whatever. It's good enough for me. And I, I think the main, the reason I went with the A7S for I think 700 bucks when I got it, instead of an original Blackmagic Pocket or something like that is because of the low light sensitivity. That is one of those technical absolutes that's objective rather than subjective. The A7S is 
probably the best low light camera around besides its older brothers. And knowing that a significant portion of my following film takes place at night, I tried doing tests on my T3i, it looked terrible, you couldn't see anything. And I'm not just talking about raising the ISO so I can see into the blacks and they look, you know, medium gray. I'm talking about using practical lights in my walls. I can use this light to light a room. That's insane because you can't do that with the T3i. This is not bright enough to light a room. You need a hell of a lot more light. Um, and I can do that now and I can still keep that uh, sort of high contrast uh, lighting that I really like without sacrificing you know, visual legibility. Very long story short, I guess. It made me mad because I was thinking about sort of the way his view of film versus digital, of like completely discounting digital as television in public and all that was not just rude, but it was short-sighted. It's film, it's called film because that's what we call it. And it's kind of a misnomer if you're talking about digital, but Film in general is not about the acquisition. The Godfather is blurry and grainy and soft, and I love it, and it looks amazing. Uh, Gone Girl is impossibly sharp and precision machined every pixel in that image, and it's gorgeous, and I love it. And there's no right or wrong version of that because the Go Gone Girl is a great movie and The Godfather is a great movie. And that's kind of what it boils down to. It doesn't matter what it was captured on. It doesn't matter where you first watched it, whether it was a fucking iPad or an IMAX theater that was perfectly tuned. It doesn't matter where you first fell in love with it. The point is that people like movies and they deserve to be able to watch movies, whether that's on an iPad or a TV or a theater or wherever. Also, quick side note, I fucking hate theaters. I've like I said, I'm an American, which means that for most of my life, I've been afraid I'm going to get shot. Sometimes that's not even the most annoying thing about a theater. It's like, yeah, I'm afraid of getting shot, but you know, uh, I've made this joke too many times for it to be funny anymore, but it's not a joke. I'm an American. I'm afraid of getting shot everywhere. I don't really care anymore. But my, you know, my, my more middle of the road experiences, I watched Godzilla 2014. I liked the movie. It was way too dark. I couldn't see it. Watched it on DVD. It looked great. It turned out my theater was wrong. It was too dim. The projection wasn't bright enough. These are different theaters I've been to. For the one in Dawn of the Planet of the Apes, I was somewhere in Philadelphia. For the one with Godzilla, I was here in Reading. And for uh, Endgame, I was in Delaware. Endgame, visually, great. Looked great. But the other two, they looked kind of like dog shit. And it wasn't because I went to... I didn't go to some rundown, random theater. I didn't go to some high, super, super IMAX place. I went to a middle-of-the-road regular theater and got mixed results from different places. The good side of digital is the fact that a filmmaker, a young filmmaker, can have a chance, you know, can actually now just buy a cell phone. And if they have the tenacity to actually put together a, a uh, you don't even need that much of a crew, but put together, write, uh, come up with an interesting story and get uh, some interesting actors or not and put something together, they can actually make a movie. And then that film can go on the film festival circuit and they can be legit. They can be real. You know, back in my day, you, uh, you know, you at least needed 16 millimeter to do something like that, which was uh, a Mount Everest. Most of us couldn't climb. And uh, so in a more democratic artistic society, uh, you know, we're going to have to put up with a whole lot of junk. All right. But there are maybe some uh, uh, flowers in the dustbin that will appear uh, that might not have ever had the tenacity to get a film made if, if uh, like like uh, if it was, things were like in the old days. Hail Caesar was the last thing I did on film. I mean, I just shot a film with Sam Mendes with digital and um, Blade Runner with digital. I mean, I know. I, there's so many advantages to digital. I said to somebody earlier, I mean, to me, it's like you can be on the set with a calibrated monitor and, and I can be talking to the director about the image and saying, that's what we're shooting. I like the conversation. I like the collaboration. I like, you know, it's, it's all about that discussion and figuring out how far you want to go and, you know.